Okay, everyone, I guess we can start and um, the other participants that will join in a few minutes, of course, will be admitted uh, in our today's session. So hello, everyone. For those that have not attended any of our previous webinars, I'm Yorgos Muftoglu, I am your moderator and uh, welcome officially to our uh, fifth webinar. We've made it to the half of our uh, series of webinars. So this is our fifth webinar organized under the framework um, of the project Cultural Footprint and as part of the series of webinars entitled Business and Art Come Together, we cooperate instead of competing. Now, for those that um, did not attend any of our previous uh, webinars, let me explain a little bit uh, the Cultural Footprint Project, which is a young and entrepreneurial project uh, for emerging artists, uh, which aims to develop an entrepreneurial mindset among them and encourage them to take responsibility for their professional careers. Uh, the project applies a four-step methodology that improves youngsters' skills and help them realize um, their uh, and first entrepreneurial ideas. So the first step is to inspire the artists. The second is to teach them some practical skills about entrepreneurial development. The third is to mentor them. And the fourth one is to network them. So the project idea is about promoting young entrepreneur entrepreneurship, individual tutoring, digital skills upgrading and creativity thinking among youth cultural workers and emerging artists as the role in the role of learners and business experts in the role of trainers. Hence, the project in this way promotes also the learning by doing process. So today's session um, will introduce you to the fifth module, uh, which has been developed under um, uh, the framework of the project as well as part of its educational curriculum. And it has been developed by our partners from Sweden, from Census. And I have today with me Erika, Ellen and Johan. Hello to all three of you. Thank you very much for being here today, who will be today's presenters and trainers. So. A few words about uh, uh, these uh, training's aims and objectives. This uh, training will provide you a general understanding of what a market analysis is, will provide you guidance uh, regarding identifying your competitors and doing a competitor's analysis, will also provide guidance on how to expand your audiences and to find mar a market for your art, and it will distinguish the international and national markets. Now, some general rules about the implementation of these and all the webinars organized under the Cultural Footprint Project. First and foremost, as you may see appearing on top of your screen, there is a message that says that this uh, um, meeting is being recorded. Um, this training and all, all trainings should be recorded due to the project's requirements of implementation and reporting. This is done always in accordance with the GDPR. Therefore, if you don't wish to appear in the recorded version of the, the training or in some screenshots that may be take, uh, taken later on uh, for promotional purposes, then you might as well keep your cameras turned off. Moreover, I have shared with you in the chat, and I will share it again within a few minutes, a link that leads to the digital attendance list of today's training. I will also share with you by the end of the training an evaluation form, which also must be filled in by all of you digitally. These are both again due to the project's requirements of reporting and implementation. So please, um, at this moment, access the attendance list and fill it in. This is the attendance list I have shared with you in the chat. Uh, as you can see, we are asking for your full names, the name of the sending organization, or at least the organization you were informed um, from about our webinars, your country of residence, your email address and your signature. As far as it concerns your signature, if you cannot or do not want to copy and paste your signature here, you can simply write again your full names. It works for us. But um, as I will explain in a few seconds, we need to have your full names and email addresses appearing here correctly. 
This is also the evaluation form that I will share with you by the end of the training. As you can see in this slide, and it can be accessed both from your computers and your mobile phones. Now, some rules of communication. As I said before, this training is currently being recorded and some screenshots may be taken later on during the implementation for promotional purposes. If you don't wish to appear in either of them, then you can keep your cameras turned off during the whole session. Now, as far as it concerns your microphones, your microphone should be muted during the whole session unless you're asking permissions or generally having the permission to speak. In the case of questions, please first raise your hands here digitally and once the trainers have given you permission to speak, then you can unmute yourselves. Lastly, please make sure that you've entered with your full names appearing correctly and especially Please write your full names and email addresses within the attendance list to appear correctly. This is very important for us because if you if we don't have your full names and your email addresses, then we won't be able to issue certificates of attendance for you by the end of the trainings. And as I'm saying in the chat, if by any reason you cannot access the link to the attendance list, then if it's okay uh, with you, you can write us in the chat your full name, your countries of residence and your email um, addresses, and I will include you in the attendance list. So uh, before giving the floor to today's presenters, this is an indicative agenda of today's training. We're done with the introductory part of the training with the rules of communication. So uh, the next 45 um, minutes before a, sh a very short break will cover the introduction to the um, whole market analysis, market research topics and how to find your collaborators, your competitors. And after the short break, you, we will also um, cover the topics of how to find a market for your art and to expand your audiences. And the last five minutes of the training will cover some conclusive remarks either by you or by the trainers. And uh, during this short period, I will share with you the link to the evaluation form to be filled in by all of you. So. Thank you very much for joining today's session. And without further ado, um, Ellen, Herrick and Johan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you hear us OK? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, we're figuring of introducing ourselves first. Um, maybe we can start with you, Erika. Yes, for sure. Should I? One second, I'm just going to take away yeah. the screen. Yes. OK. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Erika. I'm working together with um, Helene Lise, my colleague uh, that you can see with Erasmus Plus um, projects here at Census. We're coordinating the projects here and uh, our projects is largely about inclusion, music, culture and uh, working with people that are often socially excluded in the society. And we, I work at Census, Stockholm, Gotland. OK, over to you guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I'm Johan Sigrid. Um, uh, I am the manager of Census music team here in Stockholm, uh, but also work uh, uh, a little bit around Europe for uh, specific projects and stuff that we have. Uh, our goals at Census music team uh, is to um provide uh, help for producers and musicians and studio collectives and uh, the likes of that uh, to try to help them with the support that they need so um, we try to um, uh, we try to talk to them and we have you know conversations about like what's your next steps and and you know part of that we have a big toolbox for you know, depending on what their needs are. So it could be rehearsal spaces or studios or um, live shows. Uh, and we try to provide them with all that, as well as networking uh, possibilities uh, for them to actually uh, create relationships uh, in the music business. Um, yeah, and my background is in music, obviously. Um, um, I started my first band when I was 15 and uh, got a record deal when I was 18. So from that, it's been a lot of, uh, you know, touring and stuff like that, but also also been 
uh, in r and the pr um, head of pr at a music label uh, releasing hip hop um, and the past like 15 20 years which is weird to say i also been uh, um, into music production and uh, mixing and stuff like that audio engineering so i've been uh, doing all sorts of things uh so yeah Thank you. Yeah, and hello. You here we have a real specialist here who's both been on and be behind stage. Yeah. Which I think is really good. And my name is Helene Riese. And uh, as Erika said, I work together uh, with her and some other persons in the project department here at Census. Uh, and my background is also in culture, where I have worked both as a uh, cultural producer and planner, uh, both in theatre and music, and also as a marketing director on different theatres, both in uh, uh, local, regional and national levels. So hopefully we will bring into our uh, different experiences from different uh, uh, sectors of art to this uh, presentation. And we hope that we really have some emerging artists or maybe startups in the cultural industry here with us today that want to share some experiences with us because the topic of today is getting to know your market. You know, when you want to establish yourself as an artist, no matter in what area, music, art or writing or theater or something else, it's a good idea to look at yourself and your work as a product on a market. This can sound strange to some but actually you want to sell your things in some way so it can be good to to um, uh, just see your products as a part of yourself and by following the steps in a traditional market analysis and a market strategy uh, you can it will be a lot easier for you to reach your goals as an artist and to know which activities to engage in so, Erika, if you'd like to start the presentation. I was just about to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. One second. And start from the beginning. Here we go. You can go down to topics. From here? Is it okay? Next one. Next one. Yeah, so the topics for today is to look at what is a market analysis. Uh, look at the competition, who are my competitors, and then uh, when you have done the internal analyzing, it's time to look a bit external, to look at how can I expand my audience, where can I find a market for my art, and uh, should I choose an international or a national or a local market. So, in next slide. Next one, yeah. The learning outcomes for today, we hope that you will understand after this presentation what a market analysis is and how, where to, how to find out uh, who your competitors are and also seeing how you can expand your audience and find a market for your art, no matter what art form you're into. And also have a little understanding of the differences between the international or national markets. So next question. Yeah. So uh, today we're going to talk about market research and uh, market analysis, uh, like Helen said. Um, these two are really fundamental uh, in the corporate world, uh, but sometimes I know I also know that it seems hard to apply that. Maybe if you are in creative work or especially onto your own art. Uh, but we will dare you to do that today because um, it could be helpful uh, to do it. You know, if, if you have never done it before, it's a good way to do it, you know, because it will get you to an objective standpoint to be able to look at what you're actually doing, like from outside. Uh, but also, you know, gives you new perspectives going forward. So first things first, <laughs> what am I selling and why am I selling it? Um, and this is to get a starting point to know actually what your market, uh, uh, to, to get to know your market, you need to, the first thing you have to do is like to know what you're actually trying to sell to the market. Uh, and uh, um, this is, uh, you know, 
different uh, what is different about your work uh, compared to other person's work and and what's your most important goals uh, with your work uh, to answer those questions you need to trace back to the source uh, in this case back to yourself if you're an artist and you try to sell your music uh, then you need to know why you know why are you making this music what made you come to the point where you actually you know created this that you tried to sell uh, so i will give you some examples of that you can go to the next slide so uh, regardless of what art form for me practice and what to develop further uh, the works pieces or songs wouldn't exist without you um, and the you know the distinctive creativity and craftsmanship of its creator uh, and the reasons like behind why you actually starting you know engaging in this and uh, trying to um, you know to create whatever it is if it's pottery or uh, paintings or music um, is quite different from each other um, and I'll try to give you some exam examples of that uh, so one very common reason for the drive to create is self-expression. Uh, art in every form can be a very direct tool to express one's thoughts or dreams, emotions and views of the world or values. And that's one thing. Uh, it could also be that you want to communicate something. Um, in, in this case, I mean, it could be like uh, to raise awareness uh, over like uh, social issue or political issues or, uh, or the likes of that um, to address like-minded people to try to start like a you know a, um, a bus to fight for something together or something like that or it could also be you know provocations towards uh, those who disagree against the power or whatever it's pretty common um, and for many people, making art is their most immersive way to relax. So it could be like recreational um, to actually be able to, you know, leave the world behind, just sit down with your piano or take take your brushes out or whatever. Um, and um, it could also be, you know, strive to create something unique, something that never before, you know, existed before you actually did it. Um, and we could call that like exploring the unknown, uh, for example. Uh, and for others, choosing a path as a creative artist is that they have like a really concrete goals. Uh, maybe they want to earn commercial success or personal fame uh, as the ultimate goals. Um, and contrary to to that, other artists downplays that factor of success as their main drive and focusing on more on like abstract reasons, like following a notion, an artistic calling, a need win that's forcing the artist to create. And, you know, going to myself, uh, I think, you know, there's probably like a mix between uh, a few of these. Um, and I think like everyone can relate to, to some of them, at least, uh, like the reasons why you start creating. Um, but to understand that what inspired you to create your art and to develop as an artist is like a key also in this to try to, you know, to know what you're selling. It's also really important to know why you actually have this piece of art that you're actually selling. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, and it's also it will also guide you a little bit to like what sort of uh, path forward uh, are you aiming for and what goals are you aiming for? And I think they should like harmonize well with your ambition, but also like you know where your art is coming from. Uh, it's important to you know put that also into this more like stale corporate way of uh, thinking about markets and uh, and strategies in that way. Um, so, to, but to be able to view your art from that point of view of others is a crucial skill for you to target the most suitable art, uh, market for your product uh, or like your audience, for example. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. 
uh, I like this picture because, <laughs> uh, like, on the right side, uh, um, you know, I think it really represents like how it is to be a creative entrepreneur. Because uh, you have on the right side, you have all this like I don't know, almost psychedelic uh, mix of ideas and uh, you know sudden notions or whatever. <clears throat> but you also to be able to make it uh, your living or at least part time, you know, living to actually earn some money for it and earn like that sort of success that you want to earn. Uh, you have to also have that other side, like ideas plan management strategy and like <clears throat> how you actually uh, uh, how others perceive yourself and uh, the goals and or like the stepping stones towards that <clears throat> so um uh, it's also i think it's also like shows that it's how demanding it can be <laughs> you know um and um and that you also have to have um, a lot of knowledge in several areas. Uh, it's a really big drif difference from like how it was before. Um, sorry, I have to take a sip. Uh, and it's also interesting in that way because I've been working so long <laughs> uh, in the industry, so I've also seen seen it change. You know, um, like when we got a record deal, when we were like, I don't know, we were. So, yeah, 17 or 18 or something like that. Uh, the only thing we had to care about was to like write songs, record songs, play the songs live. I mean, we didn't do anything else. Um, then we had like the record company and the um, uh, booking agency that took care of everything else. But during the you know the times, I mean, I also had this record company when, while Napster was really big for a while and that also changed the revenue flows uh, a lot and all these kind of things uh, sort of led to the point where we are today <clears throat> that you have to at least uh, if you're like a single person like you know promoting yourself uh, doing the art and um, you have to do everything at once um, so it's also it's a really good way to like um, linking back to some of the other modules here uh, about the one with uh, cooperation that you could actually I mean you should probably get a team <laughs> that you know has different different abilities so you can work on this together regardless actually of what uh, what sort of art you make. Uh, but anyway, um, is the other like hard things about this is also um, um, uh, I mean the creative business uh, and being like a cultural entrepreneur um, you know if you compare that to you know doing something more um, corporate uh, is that uh, it, the culture sector can be or at least seem really unfair and random <laughs> you know it doesn't really matter like um, uh, the work you put in doesn't always, you know, give you better outcome than other people that don't really put in that much work uh, and get greater success because it's like there's a lot of, uh, you know, things that doesn't really exist in that, you know, level in other uh, um, in other businesses like timing trends good connection and network is is of course i mean you have to do that you know regardless what you're selling but um those uh, are extremely uh, big factors of if you reach the success that you aiming for uh, and yeah it's unfair business so it's like uh, <laughs> it's a hard thing to get into so it, so in that way it's really important that you put up goals that's not only you know, goals of success or like fame or um, economical goals. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you're gonna you need to ask yourself a few questions about your ambitions and goals. Uh, that will help you prioritize and channel your energy in the most productive way. Uh, yeah. So it's not. <laughs> uh, so as well as give you answers on how to present your art for the market going forward. And uh, then I'll leave the floor to Helen.
Yes, so uh, after hearing these um, serious words from you, Juan, uh, it's uh, interesting words. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Didn't mean like that. We want all of you to <laughs> have a, a small reflection about uh, what are your driving forces? What, what made you get started in this in your areas of art? And what it is, it, what motivates you to still keep going? So while you're thinking about this, I will ask you, Johan. Yeah. You, you told us before about your uh, what was your motivation in the beginning of your career. Mm -hmm. So now, some years later, <laughs> what are your drivers? Um, yeah, I think uh, more or less it's sort of in the same areas, I guess. Um, but like going back to when I started making music uh, and started my band at 15, um, I think it's like a um, mix between the self-expression thing, the communication and the exploring the unknown. Because mm. uh, I grew up in a like mid-sized city in the north of Sweden, uh, where I felt, especially as a teenager, I felt like the norms were suffocating and I wanted to make music that stood up, uh, you know, for different ways of different lifestyles, mainly, I guess, uh, and um, uh, to, you know, make people behave uh, however they like, like without, you know, outside the norms. And I wanted to make music that felt new, like a mix mm -hmm. uh, of sounds that you haven't heard together before, you know. Um, uh, I think it's sort of the same drive today, but okay. in different you know ways and, and genre, of course. But you mentioned before this uh, motivation of self-expression. Yeah, Would, is that something you identify with? Yeah, not not as much anymore. But as, <laughs> I think it was more like a, it's, it was more like a teen thing. But but still, uh, I think you know it's in there somewhere. Like. Um, I, I don't play live that much much anymore, but like when I do, I kind of feel that, mm -hmm. you know, it's a good need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about your goals? I assume that they're maybe a bit different now from from back then. But um, like if you would put yourself on the stage now, mm -hmm. do you think like more long term goals or short term? Or are they different? Yeah, I don't have any like goals in that no. way anymore for my music. I just. Um, I make music because I like I'm used to making music, yeah. so I like I, I have to make music. But um, but um, like when I started out, I think um, uh, they I didn't have it was only artistic goals that mattered for me. Uh, you, you you mentioned you got signed for a record. Yeah, was that quite early in your career. Or? Yeah, yeah. Oh. So yeah, when I was eighteen. Yeah. So you didn't have to struggle for it. No, I struggled for three years. <laughs> no, no, but no, re not really. Uh, no, um, okay. Uh, not in that way. But um, um, but it was it was uh, definitely artistic goals, not business like okay. goals. And that's also a good thing to I don't know to think about as well, because we never talked about that in my band, for example, uh, and. Uh, I don't know, five years in, in the band, uh, one band member left the band mm -hmm. because the others, we had more like, the others that were still left in the band had more like, a, yeah, yeah, you know, doesn't care. We don't care if we get successful. But he felt it was like, yeah, uh, when we said no to a lot of TV commercials, he didn't want to be in the band anymore uh -huh. because like, yeah, you don't want to succeed, sort of. Okay. <laughs> uh, and we never talked about it before, so. That's a good thing to ask ask yourself also as a group to see if you have do you have the same goals like mm. if you have different uh, persons in the group uh, do you share the same goals or are they different from each other mm. um, so yeah so it seems that you you achieved the, your artistic goals that you had uh, would you have felt different do you think or how would you have reacted if you would not have met your artistic goals. But that's the thing. If you only have artistic goals, uh, then it's based on sort of, I mean, you make sort of music or in this case yeah. uh, that you like. And I mean, that is easier to achieve than to be like, yeah, we're going to play Wembley, you know, um, as a successful goal. Um, but um, 
I think like regardless of what you have, uh, I think you should still like divide it up, you know, in uh, uh, in like smaller stepping stones, uh, things, goals that you can actually reach, yeah. and you have like a time period mm -hmm. for reaching them. Um, for example, if you like, if you're a rap group that want to play Lollapalooza the festival, which is a big festival, um, then you shouldn't have that as like your main goal every year, yeah. because then you have to divide it into like, uh, maybe first like play fr at friends parties and small bars, and then you play at small clubs, and mm -hmm. then you do a uh, own tour that you fixed yourself, and then you get a promoter that can give you bigger music, you know, nightclubs or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you always have like small goals yeah. that you could actually reach. Because otherwise it will be like uh, you you will be like disappointed all the time, and it's really good to have a, uh, to have a good energy and also you know really cherish uh, together and like when you reach the goals. Yeah. Um, and it's like a you know put it in small pieces. Mm. I think it's a good thing. So keep the good spirits going. Yeah, they have flow. Yeah. Oh, I'm interested to know if it's anybody of you who are listening that would like to share something about your goals and, and motivations. You can do so in the chat or yeah, raise absolutely. your hand if you want to talk in person. And you can you can do it later. You don't have to. To um, say something now. Yeah. So uh, while you are reflecting about this, we can move on to the next slide. So uh, the first step uh, in in our in this um, presentation is about market analysis, and what it, what is that actually? It's it's like a study of your market, your specific market, including an examin examination of the components that are in there, and what are those? They can be like what's the size of your market. What are the, the success factors that are important in your industry? What channels uh, does the artist use in your market? Uh, who are you reaching out to? Who is your target audience? Uh, how profitable is, is your market? Is it something that you can make a living on? Uh, and uh, do you have like any possibilities to grow your business in this market if you start something and other market trends. So it's kind of a, a way to get a very um, overview uh, of, over the market so you know what you're actually, uh, what you're going into before you start making your plans. So you understand uh, the conditions uh, and can have realistic goals for what you want to do and also so you can make good decisions about what activities to do. So we can look at the next slide. Why should you do a market research? Well, it helps you, as I said, to find your audience, your the important target audience, and to stay in touch with those uh, that are, are actually your customers. A market research also helps you to understand who your fans are and what they want. So uh, later on, you can actually have some kind of dialogue with your audience. And this information can also help you to, to create the art that, that resonates with your audience and design marketing strategies that will reach them. And I understand as an artist, maybe you don't feel like you want to adjust your art to a specific audience, but it, it can all depend on what, what kind of area you're in to actually. Uh, so uh, if you have knowledge about who your current audience are and what they like, you have a good starting point to grow your fan base from narrowing down your uh, to identifying more a more specific, specific clientele. And it can also help you keep the audience you already have since you if you want if you lose your audience, you also lose everything, especially if you're starting uh, as an emerging artist. So analyzing your market will give you a better understanding of the current trends and styles within your genre. 
And by keeping keep doing this, by continuously anal analyzing your market, you'll still stay up to date. And this information will help you create art that is fresh, unique and relevant. So for what are some good decisions that you can make from knowing all this? You can discern, determine, for example, what prices you should take by looking at what do others, other actors take uh, in this market. And it can also help you to decide what platforms you want to choose for distributing your products. And also maybe to identify possible other artists to collaborate together with and also to see what the competition looks like. So uh, you need to start by asking yourself, what are your personal goals? Uh, and put up some milestones that you want to, to reach. Uh, be, try to be realistic and, and think, what kind of market do I want to reach? Do I want to have like a small and very specialized audience? Or do I want to go out big out in the mainstream to have a, a larger audience maybe that are less loyal? Uh, and also you can see if there are other artists in the same area as you, because that means that you will have a potential to collaborate with them or to, to know um, what difference differentiates you from, from them uh, as competitors. You can take the next slide. So uh, if I say I, I am an artist and I want to go about to start to make some kind of market analysis, what should I look at? You can identify your target market by looking at your key audience, your fans and your supporters and your customers, and then try to imagine what your ideal customer would look like. Try to think about maybe if you have some good customers already, uh, look at who are they? And are there others out there that are similar to them? You can identify the needs in the community and industry, for example, by making interviews uh, or, or doing other kind of research. And also you can look geographically uh, and to see uh, where is your audience located and where do you want to be? Uh, and in these days with Internet, it can be also uh, digitally. So, and also, of course, it's important to analyze emerging trends, looking where is my industry going? It's not the same today as it will be tomorrow, and it probably has changed a lot since yesterday as well. So you can take the next slide. So you could actually say like some very concrete steps to do a market research. Uh, as I said, number one, define why you want to do this research. What are what are you looking for? What do you want to find out about your market? Uh, and then when you have done uh, your analysis, you can study them uh, closely to see actually uh, who am I competing with? Uh, what kind of art and or music or theater or literature are they selling? And how do I differentiate from them? Uh, and then you choose the right type and method for your needs uh, to create your market strategy later. You can recruit uh, research subjects. For example, you could create like a focus group uh, of some fans that you like to interview about how what they think about your music. And then you can conduct your research in many ways. Uh, it's just important that when you have your results that you try to draw some conclusions of them to make an action plan and have a roadmap for where you want to go next. Uh, and to make this uh, just a little bit concrete, uh, I want to uh, give you an example. Uh, for a long time ago, I used to work in the music industry with small touring artists. This was long before internet. Yeah. <laughs> And also in Sweden, we have a, a tradition of bands going all over the country, playing in different uh, clubs or at uh, dance restaurants and so on. Okay. So uh, we're imagining that you're a newly started cover band and your goal is to get concert bookings for a tour at music stages or dance restaurants all around the country. So the first step for you is to make a list of who your key audience is today. 
uh, and who are your desired fans in the future? So you can make a list of their profile, for example, their age, their gender, where, where do they live? Do they have other interests? So an example could be a key audience now are is teenagers who love hard rock, preferably living in northern Sweden. And maybe these groups also have a very big interest in American cars from the 60s. Uh, this gives you an idea also of how can I find this, this audience. And then you want to look at what kind of audience would I like to have in the future? Maybe it's, yeah, it's the same people, but I want to have them not only where I live, but all over the country. Then you can ask yourself, uh, where does my target audience go to listen to my kind of music? Is it at big concert halls or maybe smaller pubs or dance restaurants? You can also look geographically at possible locations where your kind of music is on stage. Is it in small towns in the countryside or more central cities? or maybe in niche clubs or in, um, in suburbs of Stockholm, where you don't normally go. When you have collected all this information, you can make a list of possible places where you can find an audience who likes your music and where there are possible stages who would like to book your band. Also, you can find out how to reach your audience after identifying their interests and guessing which channels to reach them in your marketing strategy. Other ways to do a market research is to follow some bands who play similar music to you. You can find out where they give concerts by following them on social media. In this way, you find out which channels that also could be good for your band to be presented in. Another way also is through a qualitative research by, as I told before, creating a focus group and make interviews. In the case of the music band, it could be to ask some persons in your target audience to listen to some different tracks of your music and to music from other bands who represent the same kind of music. And then you can ask them to rate the songs that, uh, so you can find out what, which songs they like most. So these are some very basic methods and I'm sure uh, you all have done maybe similar things, but I just wanted to show you that uh, it doesn't have to be so complicated to do actually a market research and to take the first steps in creating your plan. Yeah, can I add uh, like a really good thing that works in like all in the whole cult cultural sector is also uh, to go out to clubs or galleries or whatever uh, in person uh, and you know share you know share a beer or two you know with people and party that's that's actually what drives uh, the whole cultural sector i think yeah. <laughs> like the relationships that people yeah. get you know on those big party nights um yeah should never you know be forgotten yeah in comparison <laughs> to all these other things <laughs> so like you all said the most important thing is to keep keep in contact with your audience yep. because they represent a larger audience. Yep. Uh, and then uh, you can find out what they like, find out what other people likes and and uh, don't be afraid to, how do you say, Harma, uh, follow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to imitate. To imitate because it's a good way to, mm. to find your, uh, your own paths. So you can take the next slide, Erika. Uh, I just wanted to give you a very short look at some different kind of researches that you can make. And maybe this more aims to if you're like a company, uh, then you might want to, to look at the bigger picture uh, in an industry analysis. Uh, a market analysis and market research and industry analysis are related, but they have different focus and depth. A market research focuses on a specific market, more like the, the examples that I gave. And an industry analysis examines a whole industry, including the components and players and can be conducted globally or within a specific region. So if you take the next slide. Uh, you can see here just some different types. So for example, if you want to make a business strategy for your own 
art, you can start with making a market an analysis. And then uh, you want, if you want to have to uh, outline a marketing strategy, you can make a market research. And if you want to look at the whole uh, industry, then you can make a competitive strategy where you look at different companies or uh, how does it look in a whole country, for example, if you want to find out about international markets, maybe you want to look at the record industry in China and things like that, that maybe would, uh, when there's more money involved and you want to need to make like informed decisions about uh, investments and so on. So, but uh, at this stage, I think it's enough that we look at the first steps to do the basics. So, uh, I don't know if we, it's time for a break. Uh, we are suggesting that we should, um, we should go to a small um, exercise. We can continue with the exercise, Helen, and okay, then so have we're... our uh, short break. We have okay. like we have like um, um, fifteen minutes, ten okay. fifteen minutes at our okay. disposal. Great. So then we can uh, uh, go to the next slide. So just to end the uh, the part about the analysis is that uh, understanding the market and your customers. Um, as you can see, as I gave in the example about the music band, uh, it gave uh, the band uh, some idea about the tastes and preferences for their uh, target audience and help them to do uh, better campaigns and to reach out in the right channels uh, to reach actually their larger audience as they were aiming to. So the next part that we wanted to speak about is where, how can you uh, find out uh, who is your competition? Because if you're like in the art business or in the music industry or theater or literature, you're not alone out there. There are a lot of other artists in the same genre as you, maybe fighting about for the same audience as you do. So it can be uh, a part of actually this analysis that you look at who else is out there. So um, what, what you have done is you have uh, done the first step, uh, listed your ideal customer based on your market research. And then the next step is to list your top competitors. So um, we are going to do a little exercise. So if you take the next slide, I want you all, if you have like a pen and paper, to look at, to make a list uh, of like three other uh, artists in your area who are working like in similar, uh, in similar uh, artistic expressions as you are. Uh, it doesn't have to be competitors. It can just be just just for trying to do this exercise. Mm -hmm. And just to have something concrete, I will use you one again here. <laughs> <laughs> if you could name like three other artists who are doing similar um, music as you have. Um, yeah, for my sake, I think it's easier to choose uh, maybe artists that we support here on census. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so give it to have an example. Yeah. You can take the, the next one, Alika. Um, yes. So ask yourself, uh, what do we have to offer uh, that no other artist, company, product or service does or does as well as me? Um, uh, in this case, we can uh, maybe do like um, uh, in rap music, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, so uh, you take you take a band that you have been working with, for example, or helped. Yeah. Um, I'll take um, what's it called? Um, yeah, Leo. Uh, we can take take Leo as a. Uh, he's a, he's a rapper. Uh, he's from um, Uppsala. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he's sort of like, um, he's trying to, uh, his style is uh, 
not like maybe the most popular style in hip hop right now in Sweden. It's it's been for a couple of years. It's been uh, more like the trap or like maybe the hardcore style that's like really gang affiliated uh, and uh, more you know they're rapping about guns and stuff like that but he's more like a old school okay. uh, sort of rapper um, that's like trying to embrace positivity <laughs> and stuff like that uh, but also like it goes back to to more like he uses old school beats instead of like okay. new school beats mm -hmm. i guess uh, and they, in that case, it's, it's interesting because, like, uh, he's from Uppsala, and uh, uh, it's not really a popular genre at the moment. Like, mm -hmm. the kids listen to the more negative stuff, actually, because it's like, yeah, yeah, the more gangster stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, in his case, uh, it would be interesting to, um, you know, when he looks at what his competitors are, yeah. uh, I can only find like the ones on the same level. It's probably a guy called uh, or a group called Fried List from Westeros, okay. and then uh, the random bassist crew from uh, from um, Umeå. Mm -hmm. So it's like um, uh, in that case, his uh, his strength uh, in a domestic way, mm -hmm. at least like Stockholm, Uppsala, he's is pretty alone. Okay. Yeah. Oh. In that way. Mm. So. Uh... Would you say it's like a compared to his strength that he is more like positive in his tone? Yeah, or because is it, a, is it a weakness? Yeah, it depends on like what you want to do, of course, and what your goals are. But uh, if you, if we're speaking in the case of who has the largest largest audience, yeah, probably. the audience is not that big. Yeah. But still, uh, a strength there is like if not many people are doing the same thing, mm -hmm. then that's a strength. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. Because then, in that case, you have the less competitors you have uh, in that area, and it's also, uh, you know, trends shift all the time. Yeah. Especially in a small country like Sweden, it's like mm. there's no loyalty in like uh, in the music industry in that way. Um, so like everyone, you know, change all the time and yeah. what they want to listen to. Yeah. So. Uh... That, that's, as I'm just explaining, when you're looking at yourself compared to the others, you look at what is your company's or your product's strength compared to your top three competitors, and in what areas are do you consider that you're weaker compared to your um, competitors? And then you can look at the counterpoints, which means that if you're, for example, we take the 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 rap. Yeah, Man, Leo, Leo. Leo. Yeah. If it's written in the papers that he's a, he's a very bad influence on young people today because no, sorry. No, he's no, a good influence. Was, <laughs> if we take the other one, the, the yeah. competitors, yeah. they are very bad influence because they're influencing, uh, inspiring young persons to violence. Yeah. For example. Yeah. Then then this is something uh, that Leo can use. Yeah, as a strength to use in, in his marketing. So actually what you're doing is you take advantage of uh, your competitors weaknesses. So it can be like it, yeah, it's a bad sport, but good sport. You have to be smart <laughs> when you want to uh, market yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. So uh, this now you got an example and I would like you to. Uh, we have something here from. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Maybe want? his audience are older generations who enjoy old school rap. Absolutely. Yeah. Right now it's older, <laughs> uh, probably the old school rap. But like you can also see that it's coming back, like everything yeah. else, like in rock music. Uh, yeah. All the young kids now listen to nineties uh, indie music. Yeah. So. And also, it could be like if you are your goal is to sell records yeah uh, then it could be a, a strength to have older customers or older audience because they generally maybe buy more records yeah they have more money yeah <laughs> so that's so, good. so it's, it's yeah. all about what you uh, are um, what you want to measure mm. so i think it's this is kind of a fun exercise that you can use in all kinds of uh, things that you want to explore. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we encourage you to 
to do this exercise either now or later. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully this will help you to, to find out what is your unique selling point. Because the whole purpose of this exercise is to find out what is uh, differentiating me from others. And it gives you also uh, an answer about where is your position on the market. So if you're speaking about traditional products, mm. for example, if you're looking at car car brands, you can say, OK, Mercedes is here and a Volvo is here and mm. a, a Simca is yeah. down here. Yeah. So, so it's important to know where, where am I on this map? Because you should have realistic competition. Uh, maybe it's not uh, a good point to try to compete with ABBA mm -hmm. or so, some artists who are in another genre or, mm. or, or uh, have a lot of uh, longer career. So they're much more exposed. Uh, and um, so it's, it's also about being realistic and finding uh, finding um, again the right path to take. Mm. Uh, where should you put in all your efforts in marketing yourself? So, does anybody have a question or or like to share something? No. So then, I guess it's time for a break. So, Yorgos, is it ten minutes? Yes, ten minutes. I think it's fine. Okay, so we see you later then. See you in 10 minutes. Great, everyone. Bye.
Shall we proceed? Great. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all back from the pause. That you got done what you needed to do. So before we go into the next part, uh, we've been speaking a lot about competition. And we just want to say that, of course, instead of competing, other artists can complete your works. You can build a hype together featuring vocals on each other's songs, for example or you can add an example from pop to urban music. In that way, you can expose yourselves to both your audiences at the same time. And this mindset also, of course, applies to other art forms. So uh, knowing your, uh, your competitors does not mean that you can't uh, collaborate together with them. Uh, and before the pause, we had a, uh, some time to look inwards, doing the analysis and um, exploring uh, our uh, goals and aims. And now it's time to look a bit externally to look at how to actually find that market. And yeah. you one has some good tips. Yeah, something about social media. <laughs> uh, we can go there. Um, yeah. yeah. Next one. Next one. Yep. So, of course, you have to have social media presence. Uh, I mean, doesn't matter what you do, but if you create something that you want to sell or, you know, get an audience for, of course, you need to have that. And uh, there's, uh, we're going to give some like examples of a few uh, that have, yeah different um, purposes um, but I mean it's also a good thing to you know depending on what sort of art form you do uh, it's uh, like more suitable one of the other can be more suitable for you um, but it's a good tool to uh, as Helen said um, connecting to similar artists um, and uh, follow them like-minded artists to you know, study them and what they do, and of course, interact with them as well. It's like, I think it's weird that uh, people people interact very little, I think. Uh, I don't know what, what that is, because I'm like, at times when, um, you know, I I wanted to, you know, ask someone a question, you can probably, you can ask like questions to every mid-level artist and you will probably get an answer back. So I think uh, that's something you know people should do more. Um, and also, it's not even only music. I, I mean, there's a lot of designers and uh, artists that are collaborating as well nowadays. But um, yeah, spend some time and you know build a network, uh, regardless of what you know service you use. You should build a network. Um, and also, when you built that network, you also have a decent number of people that you can actually uh, ask questions, do market research on. Um, so use their data because, um, yeah, we're going to get into that a little, more, a little bit more later. Uh, so uh, just a couple to name a few here. Um, TikTok is, of course, uh, it's the biggest one actually now, um, and uh, but it's focusing on viral vid videos, and uh, all of these have, you know, different ways of working. Uh, like the all, the algorithms are different, and they also change. So like if one thing worked for TikTok, you know couple of months ago, um, it's not sure that they, the algorithms promote that same thing again. But one thing that is really good with TikTok is, I mean, if you want to get across and get a viral video, you should wait <laughs> until you sign up because like uh, it's sort of the algorithms there are, um, they're done in a specific way that like when the, the first posts that you do on your new account, 
will get promoted. So like, I don't know if you have any experiences from that, but I have, because I have two kids. <laughs> and like uh, the first uh, post that they do, they like, they gone viral, not like viral, viral, but like, I mean, they reached, you know, many people uh, mm -hmm. that, just because like it's uh, you know it's a way of like dragging them in actually so it's like uh you know the pusher on the street like yeah you get the first kick for free yeah mm -hmm. so that's TikTok, um uh, and it's uh maybe the most playful of these uh, then instagram everyone we, everyone knows about instagram uh it's focusing on visuals but um instagram is also like trying to adapt everything that the other popular platforms have all the time so it's like it's changing a lot uh, and um, that is the same thing with algorithms you should like i mean if you want to get your um, stories or whatever seen uh, you should really you know spend some time researching that and and research that are like three months old is mostly useless i mean it's like because they changed it all the time. And, but it's the same there. Like if they uh, implies like a new uh, format of uh, publishing stuff, like the reels was, I mean, during when they put in the reels, uh, then you get much more exposure like on the new ones because they, um, yeah, they want get, to get people over to the new way of publishing like that function. Uh, Behance is like, um, it's a portfolio um, based one, um, which is really suitable if you work with um, uh, photographs or, or paintings and stuff like that. It's almost like, um, yeah, it sort of works like a, um, like a own site or something that like you can actually show up, like showcase what you do. Um, uh, yeah. And Pinterest. Uh, yeah, we call it the semi-social platform here um, because it is, but there are actually um, influencers that are really big on Pinterest, so um, they definitely, you know, get something out of that value for their own products and so on. Um, but it's mainly for like inspiring with ideas of yeah, furnituring and stuff like that, like home decorations, but also um it's also very visual but it's um yeah it's a pin it's pinterest you probably know about it but i mean you can always use these platforms in a way that they weren't meant to do it's so like um going back to the the analysis that you had before um the, the break uh, we can i mean you can take those you can also see like who's are what what artists are big on Pinterest? Probably none, you know, <laughs> because nobody's using it. So the, in that way, it's always interesting to maybe you should you know come up with a good way to use a platform in a way it wasn't mm -hmm. intended to be in the beginning. Because in that way, you're almost alone, you know. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. yeah, be creative about that too. Uh, Facebook, um, that's uh, really big. I mean, it's the biggest one um, uh, in the world. You know, I think it's after TikTok, as I think TikTok is almost as big now, but I'm not sure. But it's definitely uh, for older people. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I would like uh, it, it's not being used that much uh, for people like up to 20, I guess. So uh, I, I, I'm old, so I'm using it, but I'm not that much. <laughs> uh, so I'm sort of like more on the Instagram side, I guess. But um, uh, it's really good for, um, you know, reaching out. And also, uh, you should definitely have like a, a page there, even if you doesn't if you don't use it that much. If you focus more on Instagram, you should uh, uh, make sure that all the Instagram posts are at least sharing to to Facebook. So you don't have to, to like do double publish publications uh, <clears throat> because it's the same company that owns it, Meta. Uh, uh, then you have YouTube. Uh, you all know, know about YouTube. We're gonna you know look into that a little bit on the analysis side later. 
uh, Twitch, um, it's it came from like live streaming um, video games or like PC games and stuff like that. But uh, especially during the pandemic, it became really big, you know, from live streaming from all sorts of content. Um, Vimeo is like a little bit posh version of YouTube or something. It's more like it's it's like, like filmmakers uh, use it mostly. And it's also, I'd say it's a little bit more artistic, maybe. Mm -hmm. Like if you're a video artist, maybe you don't have your uh, your videos on Facebook or, or YouTube, I mean, so maybe you choose Vimeo first. And that's also because like when in the beginning, uh, Vimeo allowed uh, a big, much bigger resolutions than on YouTube. Uh, I think they were like the first social media to support 4K, for example. So that's why where it's sort of divided like that. But it's not as big, but it's, it can be really good to use as a portfolio if you're working like moving images uh, instead of Behance. Um, they, then, then maybe you should choose to have like your stuff there on Vimeo as a portfolio. Um, and PixelFed uh, is a social media without the algorithms. Um, the algorithms that I talked about earlier uh, is the meaning of algorithms is uh, what content on the platform that gets promoted. Um, and that's actually like what things you see post that po that get posted that you actually see. Uh, and that's like a big problem on Facebook, for example. Um, you only see like uh, updates from uh, from people or uh, you know pages that you visit a lot, so you sort of create that filter bubble. And uh, on Facebook, they do it on purpose because they want uh, the companies or like the artists and stuff that are on Facebook to uh, pay money to to be seen, sort of. Uh, but pixel fed. Um, it's not, I mean, it's it's without algorithms. So it's like everything you see, if you follow uh, this many people, you see everything they post. Uh, and it, it was the same on Instagram in the beginning uh, before Facebook bought it. <laughs> so now you don't really see everything uh, on Instagram either. Um, so yeah, but on the other hand, uh, I don't know anyone that's on Pixel Fed, but it's like it's nice to it's nice to have it there as a, an option to know what sort of stuff you have. So let's go into the analytics of things, because um, all the biggest streaming services have platform built especially for artists, for you guys to uh, monitoring. Um, uh, how your songs or videos or content are being streamed. Um, and if you don't have like artist profile um, on, especially on YouTube and Spotify, if you make music, you should definitely take control over that profile. Because it doesn't, it, you have to do that manually. You have to, um, you have to start up an account and you have to like, um, if you have stuff on uh, Spotify that is already released, you have to claim that. And uh, you have to, like, you know, put in uh, truth and uh, pro uh, proof, I mean, <laughs> proof that you are the actual uh, artist. So you are uh, able to get to the inside parts. Um, and they do some similar things. Um, they do demographics. Uh, of the users who stream your content and uh, they also have the age and gender uh, and location where they did it. Um, I have some examples I think in the next slide. Uh, so this is how it looks like inside of uh, YouTube Studio. Um, YouTube Studio uh, and YouTube are owned by Google, so you don't really need you. You don't have to like make a new user or anything. You can just connect it to 
uh, your Google account. But uh, if you want to have a channel, um, then you you have to like create a channel within your user. Um, so it's on the an uh, analytics tab here, um, and it shows like on what day um, these three <laughs> views <laughs> have been uh, <laughs> have been streamed, uh, and. Um, that would be interesting to show this in uh, in real time and like you know go around and check out all the uh, statistics but um we just do it quite quickly but this uh, updates in real time so it's i mean if you actually have a channel that are you know uh, active uh, it's um, you can really see like what things they like and not like this is just like some old channel that, that's not used anymore but just to get you an idea of how it looks um so uh, yeah you can go to the next slide uh here's inside uh, wow. uh, spotify for artists uh and this is for like an old really old band i had uh but um I was able to go into it in a way. So um, these releases was actually before streaming actually existed. So it's really random, but it's much more fun actually to see like who's actually streaming this stuff now, you know, when it was released, uh, you know, year 2000. <laughs> so it's interesting. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, to the right there, <clears throat> it's, uh, uh, the period we're looking at uh, on default is always the last 28 days um, for like successful songs I, I do right now then you can actually you actually you know sit and wait for um, like the day after it was released or it, it takes sometimes um, you know three days for the stats to come up so I think that's why they have like 28 days or something like that so it's like they don't count the first days uh, but you can see uh, the amount of streams uh, the amount of listeners that's been um, uh, streaming so in this case it's like 57 listeners uh, and they've been streaming uh, 94 times. So, yeah, a couple of, you know, did two <laughs> songs or like maybe they did the two songs like, you know, during this period. Uh, you can also see like how many people, uh, how many streams and listeners uh, on the past 28 days. Um, and it was 1,649. And someone saved it. One person saved it. And uh, nine playlists added it. That's pretty interesting, actually. I don't, I don't know what that is, but if I really want to know, I can dig deep into, you know, the whole way down to see what uh, playlist that actually added it. But the thing is that I think the playlist needs to have 50 subscribers. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, you just see. Otherwise, it's sort of like it's an, you know user friendly or playlist. So it's like. You know, if you have a playlist and added it, I wouldn't see it as, oh, Helene added it, you know. <laughs> no, so I wouldn't, but like if you my, had a... My mother, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if you if you had like uh, 50 subscribers on your playlist, I would uh, say, maybe like Helene's nice songs or whatever. Yeah. Like, I don't I never see that. <laughs> then on the right, uh, there's the audience tab, and that's also, you can see there is like the demographics and source of streams and segments and overview location. Um, and release engagement. So that's like stuff like uh, when you do a release, you should spend a lot of time in here. Um, um, but it's interesting to look at this old band to see like, yeah, it's mainly people uh, between uh, 35 and 44. That's probably people that was in my age, like when when it was actually released, who liked it back then. But then you also see like, yeah, 5% is like uh, eight, between 18 and 22. I wonder who they are. Uh, there's more males than females listening to this. You can also see that. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, here's, the, here's, here's the fun part. <laughs> it's a, like this list is long, man. It's like you can see every city 
on earth um, that's been, you know, listening to these uh, streams the past 28 days. And it's uh, so there's like eight people in Stockholm. There's three in Gothenburg. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, Sweden, it was a Swedish band. But then you have two in Tel Aviv, and two in Athens, two in Oakland, Helsinki, Madrid. Uh, yeah, so it's like, it's probably people like uh, reliving their 20, <laughs> the, the 2000s or something. Uh, but it's also um, quite a lot in, yeah, Japan. And, uh, yeah. So it's it's fun. It's fun to to do that, and especially if you have like a you know a current release because this is like twenty years old. So uh, I really think that you should look into it if you have <clears throat> music up on Spotify and claim your um, profile. So that also uh, you need to do that because otherwise you can't add like info and and you know update your photographs and stuff in the bio um yeah oh uh, let me know if you have any questions otherwise we change the slide yeah so um uh, how can I expand my audience? Um, yeah, you need to first, uh, that we've been through, identify the target audience, and then you identify the people who could understand and love what you do. Um, some of these things we showed, I showed now are definitely the tools to do that. Uh, it's also like, for example, like also, other music agencies like um, promoters that fixes live shows for for bands, they use it a lot, uh, and it's like it's only been around. Like the analytics has only been around for like five or six years, I think. Um, but um, speaking to people I know that works in the industry uh, of promotion, um, they use it like before they. Uh, make tours like before they plan a tour in in Germany, for example, because um, Germany is like a, it's a big country with a lot of um, uh, people living there, but it's also a place where um, there's a lot of cities that are like just above 100,000 people, which means that uh, they have usually like a you know, a music club or like a live club that can hold maybe 500 people. Mm -hmm. uh, and before uh, these analytics, uh, you couldn't really tell, you know, uh, if something was popular in that city. Mm -hmm. But now they can, um, now they can, you know, crunch it into big data and stuff like you take all this uh, data from everywhere and see like, uh, you know, oh, there's somebody in this city that we never knew anything about. Like, there's actually like, you know, 1,000 people streaming this like every single month. You know, uh, and that's also something that they then they take that uh, info and they can talk to the live club and, and say like, hey, yeah, we see there's like a lot of interest for this artist and. And uh, they are on tour now, so um, yeah. Can you book us? You know, so it's like a it's a good tool, um, and it's um, it's really useful. Uh, so yeah, uh, you identified the people uh, that like it. Um, most of those people, you know, you wouldn't know if they haven't, uh, you know, sent an email to you or like hit you up on your socials or anything. Um, so the next part is, you know, to to get like a guideline to, so where should I do this? Uh, you, we were into that before. Mm -hmm. uh, so the competitors, I mean, they might not be competitors. They might be people that you should, you know, cooperate with. So try to try to find the scene, you know, uh, and that's also something that you really can use the social media for. So that ends the social media part, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So um, 
something uh, that I was thinking about. Now we're speaking a lot about music since we have an expert here, but also I'm sure there are other ways to look at statistics also in like, for example, literature. You could look at Amazon.com that have a lot of statistics. You can see the most uh, sold authors and what, what categories and what subjects that are most sold, sold in which countries and so on. And uh, for art, maybe some of you have some good tips. What I can think about is, for example, auction sites where you can look at an artist and see uh, where are they sold and what prices do they get, for example. And uh, uh, so uh, if you start looking, you can find uh, analytics and statistics about all different fields. So what we want to say is, is take the time to really look into your fields because you will learn a lot. And nowadays, with uh, all the possibilities that you can have with the global market, with the internet, mm -hmm. uh, you can really find out uh, where to, to find new channels. Uh, but then uh, there's one, a backside of, that you all know of being an artist and an emerging artist, and that's the economy. And uh, one question that you need to ask yourself is, can I support myself on, on my art? Or do I need to have other streams of getting in income, like for a, a second job, which I think in reality, it's, it's uh, the most common yeah. uh, in all fields, whether you're a, a visual artist or you're a musician or a, an actor or something like that. Um, but and. A smart way is to try to think if you can find revenues that are within the line of what you're already doing. So, for yeah. example, like if you're a visual artist, maybe you can do prints, you can do book illustrations, uh, or if you're a writer, maybe you can write articles. And um, so try to to keep into um, an area uh, where you still can develop your skills. Like in, you mentioned a lot of examples from the music you can do radio plays and audio streams, so yeah. writing credits and so on. So we know it can really be a struggle, but if you can try to find uh, some way of getting like income streams for, from more places, uh, it will help you in the long run. So uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the visual artist side. One way to sell physical products uh, for example, today is to do it online. Uh, if, you, if you take the next slide, Lika, uh, we put together just some some different um, tips on how you can market yourself as a visual artist. And of course, uh, this is well known to all of you that you you should start by creating a por portfolio, like a, a something that can showcase your work and style. And this can be both of course, done physically, like uh, maybe you have a, a, a studio where you can expose uh, your things. It could be like visual art or textiles or things like that. And nowadays also it's possible for almost for free or for free to create a gallery online. Also, of course, participate in exhibitions. Try to find out what's going on in your local environment or in other places where you have a possibility to expose some of your products. It's a possibility to meet your potential clients and also find other artists that you can cooperate together with. And just as all the examples that you mentioned, use your social media channels. Artists and crafters can, can use social media to reach out to new audiences and to create followers. And I think Instagram here is a really good channel if you have like visual products. PR is also a really, really good way if you're a visual artist or a writer uh, or uh, all kind of artists to try to get somebody interested in writing about you. And a lot of times it's not only your artwork that's interesting, but you can be interesting as an artist. So, uh, and uh, like you once said, is there some place where you can stick out? and be like alone, mm. uh, try to think out of the box, see where where, uh, where do they not write about my area? Uh, could it be in a tractor magazine where I have uh, painted a tractor 
so it will be something the talk of the town on this exhibition or try to find some place where uh, where you will get attention yeah create be. your own story yeah because that's what uh, journalists look for yeah. always yeah. like regardless of what area yeah they want stories yeah that's easy because <laughs> they can just you know yeah. write yeah. up yeah they don't have to think yeah that's a good thing yeah <laughs> and also last but not least to try to uh, sell your artworks uh, your products online and there are several ones i mentioned etsy there are Sachi Art, Art Portable, and or Artsy are some examples that uh, artists use in Sweden anyway. And if you take the next slide, Erika, for example, if you want to set up an Etsy shop, it's very, very easy. You can just go to YouTube and you can find films there exactly step by step on how you create your account. It's just to uh, take pictures of your products and of yourself. Uh, upload them uh, and then you can enter shop preferences you you create uh, your products and you can also add add a payment procedure so people can pay with credit card and then you just open your shop so this is really something that we recommend you to go out there and try out and then of course you should link the address to your shop to your other social media accounts and try to to get it out there. So we wish you really good luck with all these steps. And uh, if you, you can, yeah, next one is just an example here of a site called Artworks, where different uh, visual artists are exposing their art pieces and they can also sell their products here. So it's both has both presentations of the artist and of the uh, of the products and I know that uh, some of you who are listening right now are also engaged in a lot of different online platforms and galleries and uh, which I think is really 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 good and gives you success uh, so last uh, but not least some a few words about how to choose your market because nowadays it's not like for certain that you should only be on your domestic market. Uh, it has like uh, positive and negative aspects to all of these markets. So like uh, if you have a choose to be on your local market, what does that mean? It means, of course, that you can sell your products where you are. You don't have to to take them to another place mm. if you like making um, physical things that take a lot of room like if you're making ceramics or you can't go traveling around with your pots everywhere so it can be really good then to be on a local market but if you're on a local market you can maybe combine it mm. with showing pictures of your products online uh, the, a good thing about your local market is that you understand that you meet your clients you actually see who is buying your things you hear their comments you can have a dialogue with them so it's like a lot of networking and you, of course, you can speak in your local language because mm -hmm. like in Sweden, we take for granted that everybody is speaking English, but that's not actually true. No. Uh, so uh, if you feel more comfortable that you want to be able to communicate in your own language, you're probably better off on your local market. But that's also a limitation that you don't reach out to any others. So if you take the next slide, why should anyone choose the international market? Well, I think for some obvious reasons that like, for example, you one mentioned uh, that you can reach a much, much larger audience. Mm -hmm. And also like if you have a small, how do you say, no, a, um, a very uh, narrow uh, interest, like mm -hmm. if you have a special music style or if you're like into Japanese manga mm -hmm. painting, uh, it's not for certain that you find those uh, fans in the local market, but maybe there's a huge market internationally that will find you just by using the right search words that is about your specific art. Uh, also, you can find very interesting other artists uh, who are out there mm. doing this, uh, sharing your interest, and maybe they also have customers. Mm. Uh, 
you the the backside is that you have to use other languages. Yeah. I think English is the most common, but it could be Chinese market and that's yeah. <laughs> So you, you don't have to, of course, go out to the whole world, but you can choose the markets that you're interested in. And also, maybe sometimes it's not just to go out on an international market. You have to understand some things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will not have so much success. But I really don't think that you have so much to lose. Uh, and like in, as an artist, what you can post your, your music and your visual arts or videos online and you can network and you can collaborate. So I think that there are, these are three really, really uh, nice sides uh, of going internationally. And for us working with European projects, we also get a lot of positive experiences of collaborating with uh, people in the cultural field all around Europe, which also gives us a lot of new experiences and understandings about how their markets are working and uh, what people are interested in. Which yeah. Actually, it's not exactly the same, actually. It, it does differ between countries. Definitely. So uh, now I think that was the last theory slide. I think uh, also uh, like, uh, yeah, I have, um, if you go back, um, I think uh, it's it's interesting just like a uh, thought about it so it's like um if you take uh, music for ex example i think it's been changing a lot because um, usually uh it you know if you sang in swedish or something it was uh, it was you could only sell it in sweden like or yeah norway as, as well because they like understand swedish but in denmark maybe but um that that really um, changed especially uh, in in like hip hop okay. uh, for the last two years which is really interesting because i think it's like connecting back to market analysis <laughs> uh, i think um, i mean there's like a big rapper in in uk called heady one and he released like a whole album uh, i think it was last year uh, with every song was like a collaboration with another like the biggest rapper or the rapper who had the most uh, streams in european countries yeah. so um, he uh, he did a song with uh, justin which is like um, it's a big uh, rapper in sweden uh, but he raps in swedish justin raps in swedish uh, and uh, it, I, it's really interesting that like they it's almost like they met each other in that way, you know, like they saw like who's streaming the most in in uh, uh, Netherlands. Uh, it's Luciano, he's like a rapper, he seems cool. So then they did a song together, uh, just posted um, posted their tracks and uh, like did the song together. And, and that wouldn't be impossible, I guess, just like a couple of years ago, mm. because uh, people were like under the notion that uh, I mean, if you do uh, international collaboration, it should be in English. Both should be in English, but it doesn't work. What? Okay, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I think that's uh, also mixing up. And in that way, they could use uh, each other's audiences to generate more streams. Oh. So, so um, it's definitely... Um, it's a business decision, but it's also it creates uh, some interesting, um, interesting collaborations in that way too. Yeah. Like cause some, uh, you know, I never heard anyone lately <laughs> rap in Dutch. I mean, it was, it was pretty cool. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, you can also think like that we beyond have, these. We have a comment here from Eamon who says, "I agree. I listen to German and French rap." I don't speak nor understand the language. Yeah, true. So that could be just the sound of it. Yeah. And we also have a comment here from Cecilia regarding, uh, I think, visual arts. I would definitely recommend using Instagram as an initial platform to begin trying to sell your art. It can be quite difficult to be noticed on art sales websites if you're just starting out, but easier to reach new followers via Instagram, even TikTok. It's very good, especially to show 
the behind the scenes process of creating art by making reels on Instagram. Yeah. Ooh. Wow, that's a really good idea. Yeah, that's a good thing. So thank you for all those tips. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if we have any more comments or questions so far. So we hope that you will be working on uh, the exercise because here comes our last exercise, which will be conducted by Erika. Yeah, and actually, since our time is running out, we don't have the time to do this right now because it's um, it's a big exercise and it takes approximately sixty minutes. But I and I think all of us are really recommending you all to do this by yourself because this is a very good method for you to go from your current situation to where you want to be, uh, like the the main goal you want to achieve. And it's a stepping um, one step at a time method, and it's very structured and very good for you to just grasp where do I want to be and how which steps do I need to take to get there. So you take you do five. It's a five step method, and I think you're just if if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the participants can get our presentation afterwards, maybe, so they can read these steps, because I think I don't have the time to explain all of this now. But basically, it's a five step method. You go through the, ex the one step at a time and you map out where your strengths are, your weaknesses, the resources you have and which actions you need to take to get uh, to, to the main goals. So you map where am I where am I now and where do I want to go? And from there you take the steps. And it's a very nice way, we think, to summarize what we have been going through. Uh, and it's also a way for you to see what motivates you again, where we started. So uh, I think maybe that's all from now, from us. Uh, Johan and Helen. Uh, from my side, thank you so much. I think it was really interesting to have this dialogue in between you to get the point of view from the um, from the music scene and from the theater art scene from you, Helen, and some good practical advice. Do you want to say some last words from you two, Johan, Helen? Um, yeah, I think um, I think it's a really good thing both artistically and uh, business uh, in the business point of view to um, to just try new things. Mm -hmm. I think it's like um, it's something that it's really easy also if you do like a lot of analysis and you also you know try to mimic like what other people do it's like it's good in a way to do that but it's also uh, the most commercial or like successful things are things that uh, you haven't really seen before or like mm. used things in a way that they wasn't supposed to be used in the beginning. Yeah. So just be like creative. Yeah. And have fun. You know, it's a good thing. And I'd like to refer to something you said, Johan, in the beginning, that when you're making your goals and putting out your uh, activities, take them in small steps and think long term. Uh, because um, you should have fun on the way. You should try to, to be in the flow and don't get um, disappointed if things just doesn't happen so quickly as you wish. It's, it's more important that you have small goals and uh, that you feel satisfied along the way. Uh, because um, being an artist is a lifelong <laughs> journey, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's no way to run it. Yeah. I mean. So we ho hope that you, you got some some thoughts from this presentation that will help you along in your journey. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Ellen, uh, Johan and Erika, um, for today's interactive session and for your very useful uh, insights on uh, the market um, analysis and how um, our artists can find their um, markets for their arts. So before closing today's session, everyone, um, I have uh, pasted in the chat first uh, the link to our project's website. 
um, there you will find um, useful news about the project, uh, about future activities and activities that you can also participate again and uh, be actively engaged. Um, you will also find um, in the project results section uh, the youth training handbook that has been developed under the project and there you will find all the theoretical information as well as the practical exercises about all modules and uh, there you will also find information about uh, the exercise that uh, Eric described um, uh, previously um, but you will also uh, receive the presentation of today's training in my post implementation email that I will send to all of you tomorrow um, because I agree with Erika that um, this exercise is very useful for all of you to implement it in your own at least. So um, I have pasted in the chat uh, also the link to the evaluation form. Please make sure that you follow this link and fill out the evaluation form for today's training. You will be asked to provide some demographic information generally and then select the module you, which you've just attended, the fifth module, and evaluate it because it's very important for us and for the project. And lastly, I would like to provide you with uh, another very useful uh, link about another um, uh, um, activity that has been running uh, so far, and it's very important. So um, right now we have also another uh, open registration form for the project's repository, which will host um, emerging artists' artworks um, um, for free, of course, and it, this serves as um, um, a solution for all of you to uh, network and promote your artworks and generally have your artworks uh, hosted on a pan-European platform. So I would like also to paste here the link to the registration form for the repository of uh, the project's website. There you can uh, read uh, the instructions and of course if you want to uh, register your artworks uh, to be hosted by um, the platform. So I'm pasting here the link. So you have them all at your disposal. Thank you very much for participating in today's session uh, and for being here. Our next session is on Thursday. Uh, it will introduce you to the sixth module uh, about promoting your art. Um, and it will be um, taught by our partners from the Netherlands, from incubators. So if you haven't registered uh, yet, uh, you can always contact me and uh, register for the next webinar as well. So that's all from me. Also, thank you very much for being here, everybody. Hope to see you on Thursday, y'all. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.